Hello, my name is Dmitry Vyukov. I work as software engineer at Google. And today I will try to not you let fall asleep after the lunch by presenting the talk Go Scheduler Implementing Language with Lightweight Concurrency. <clears throat> so I will talk about how to build a scheduler, how to make it efficient and scalable. And then I will talk about fairness, stacks, and preemption. Um, so this is about the Go language. Go language has built-in support for concurrency, and the main primitive for concurrency is called the Go routine. Uh, logically, Go routine is a thread of execution. So logically, it's the same as operating system thread and or core routine or a green thread. And most material in this presentation is somewhat generic and to a large degree applicable to operating system schedulers, coroutine schedulers, other languages. So hopefully you'll find it interesting and useful even if you don't have specific interest in the Go language. But there are some Go specifics. First of all, I'm going to talk about what is currently implemented in the Go language, not about something else. And the second, uh, Go language imposes on us some requirements and constraints, and we make our design decisions based on those requirements. So if you will have some different requirements, you may end up with different solutions. So let's look at what are those requirements. First of all, we want Go routines to be lightweight. And to make it more specific, uh, let's say we want to support up to millions of Go routines per process. And obviously, we want that to be efficient, parallel, and scalable. And Go routines have minimal API. Uh, namely, they have one, only one operation, which is to create a Go routine. Uh, what this means for us is that we don't have any kind of hints from a user about, say, Go routine priority, stack size, interactions, or lifetime. If we need anything of that, we need to infer that ourselves. Uh, since we want to support millions of Go routines per process and user can specify stack size, uh, to give a sane programming model, we have only one choice of implementing effectively infinite stacks for Go routines. And we want efficient handling of input-output, system calls, and C calls uh, to give programmer so-called thread per connection programming model, uh, which allows to write nice straight line code without resorting to callbacks. So to give you some taste of the goal, to, that you understand what, what is that we're trying to implement, let look, let's look at some uh, real Go code. Uh, so in the first line, we create a channel and assign it to a result chain variable. A channel is effectively just a FIFO queue. On the second line, we start the Go routine using the Go keyword, so that's our only API for Go routines. And inside of the Go routine, we send a request to a server, which may block on the network. Uh, then we parse the response and we send the result to the result channel. And the main Go routine receives the result and processes it. So what's important for us is that receive from an empty channel blocks the Go routine and then a subsequent send to this channel will unblock the Go routine. So how can we implement those Go routines? The first straightforward idea would be to try to use an operating system thread per Go routine. When a user starts a Go routine, we create an operating system thread and it will execute the code of the Go routine. So this would work because logically it's the same, but uh, it would be too expensive because um, a thread would consume at least 32 kilobytes of memory or so because we need some memory for the user stack, for the kernel stack, for some kernel descriptors and um, some other things. And to make any operations on the Go routine, say to create Go routine, block, unblock, switch, we would need to invoke system calls, which would add overheads. And also, we will not get infinite stacks. I, I will talk about this in much more detail later, why we won't get infinite stacks. OK, so this won't work. Uh, what about the thread pool? So thread pool would allow us to get only a faster Go routine creation, because we can reuse threads. Uh, but still we have bad memory consumption, suboptimal performance, and no infinite stacks. So it seems that this idea of using a thread per Go routine is not going to work. And this br uh, brings us to the idea of so-called NM threading. NM threading is when we split our execution entity into two parts. One becomes our Go routine. So Go routine is cheap because it's represented only by an object in the memory of our process. And we have full control over performance characteristics of the Go routine. 
Uh, and the second th part is the threat, which is more expensive and we have less control over performance. Uh, but we need them to get actual execution and parallelism. So how do we, uh, yes, and in this scheme, uh, we then multiplex uh, our set of goroutines on the threads. And so if we have four threads, they will run up to four goroutines at the same time, and those goroutines um, are said to be running. Uh, then we also have runnable goroutines. Uh, those are goroutines that can be executed, but we don't run them right now because we don't have uh, idle threads. Uh, and when we get, we will get a thread, we will run that goroutine. And then we also have blocked goroutines, for example, on a channel. Those should not be executed at all. Now, the problem is that uh, operating system doesn't know anything about our goroutines, so will not, it will not do any scheduling for us. So now we'll need to build a scheduler ourselves. How can we build a simple scheduler for this model? It turns out that the main thing that we need to keep track of is called run queue, which is a set of runnable goroutines. So it's the goroutines that we will need to run in future. And we also have a set of threads that actually run some number of goroutines right now. And those threads access the scheduler as necessary. For example, when a thread creates uh, a goroutine, it will put it onto the run queue and it will take the next goroutine to run from this run queue in the scheduler. And we also need a mutex to synchronize accesses from multiple threads. So here we have the runnable goroutines and we have uh, the running goroutines. Uh, where are the blocked goroutines? So it turns out that we don't need to track, keep track of the blocked goroutines inside of the scheduler. Uh, because if a goroutine is blocked on a channel, this channel object has own weight queue and the goroutines blocked on the channel are listed in this weight queue. Uh, when another goroutine blocks on this channel, we add it to this list. And when we need to unblock a goroutine from the channel, we take it from the wait queue and move it to the scheduler run queue so that we will run it later. And the same mechanism is used also for mutexes and timers and network I.O. Uh, this allows us to um, let goroutines block on those things without consuming the whole thread. Instead, we deschedule a goroutine, uh, list it on the wait queue, and let the thread run another goroutine. So this gives us the thread per connection model uh, combined with the efficiency of the non-blocking input-output. Um, so the situation is more simpler with the blocked goroutines because uh, channels are part of the runtime, so we have full control over them. We know when a goroutine block on a channel. We know when we need to unblock a goroutine on a channel. Uh, but the situation is more interesting with the system calls. Go allows the uh, program to call arbitrary system calls or arbitrary C code. Uh, they're roughly the same for our purposes, so I will just call it system calls. And the, the, the thing is that when an execution g goes into the kernel, we completely lose visibility over what happens there. So we don't know if it's still continue running or it blocked on something. We will only see uh, when it returns back from the kernel. But we don't know when it will return, if it will return, and if it's waiting, what it's waiting for. And the problem starts when all of our threads enter into the kernel, and we should assume the worst. We assume that they blocked there. And we also have some runnable goroutines, but now we don't run them because we don't have idle threads. So at, at best, we're now wasting CPU resources because we have work to do, but we don't run it. Uh, and in the, at the, in the worst case, we actually can get a deadlock. Uh, let's consider that all those threads actually blocked on semaphore inside of the kernel. Uh, and what's supposed to un, uh, release the semaphore is one of the goroutines in, in our run queue. Uh, but we don't run that goroutine because we don't have idle threads. And we know that this uh, wait cycle means deadlock. So to resolve, the, and, and this problem is uh, very common for, it's, it's common for any scheduler with a fixed number of threads. So if we don't grow number of threads, we can induce uh, artificial deadlocks into otherwise correct program. To resolve this, uh, let's say a thread uh, enters into the kernel and the last thing it does, it wakes another thread. And now that other, this other thread will pick the next goroutine from the run queue and execute it. So this allows us to restore our target parallelism level of four and continue running the goroutines and resolve the deadlock. 
Now, when the, our first thread finally exits from the kernel, we cannot simply continue running this goroutine because then we will run five goroutines and we want to run only four at the same time. If we run more, we get our subscription. So when th that goroutine returns from the kernel, we put the goroutine uh, to the run queue and the thread becomes idle. So this allows us to keep our target parallelism level at, 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 the, fixed, at the fixed level. Uh, this means that we can have number of threads more than number of cores. So it's not bad in itself, but it's just an application. Okay, so at this point we get a lightweight goroutines by splitting execution entity into goroutines and threads, and we can handle input-output and system calls. And we also have a parallel scheduler because we use multiple threads. So are we good now? And no, the problem is that this doesn't scale. And the problem, obviously, is with this global mutex, um, right? Each thread accesses the, the scheduler for just any operation to create a goroutine, to pick next goroutine to run, for system calls, for everything, they log this mutex. So it's not going to scale. Uh, there's that fancy thing called log free, which is supposed maybe to resolve contention. So should we try to use log free? Log free algorithms instead of mutexes, they use fine-grained atomic operations on memory locations. And there are several talks, I think, that will advocate for, for using log free to solve problems. Uh, but my answer is that no, this, this would be a wrong solution. And why? Let's consider the following analogy. Let's say we have a developer and they have a desk with a computer to do their work. Uh, then we hire more developers, but we don't buy more desks because it's the developer who do work, right? Not the desk. So why would we spend money on the desk? Instead, we let them all use the same computer at the same time, right? And in this analogy, the developers are our threads and the desk is our scheduler state. So using a mutex would be similar to introducing some kind of shift. So one developer works in the morning, another in the evening, another at night, but the rest are still empty. And using log free would be similar to actually letting them use the same computer at the same time, uh, using some kind of complex fine-grained protocol. Right, and obviously it's not going to work well uh, because there still will be contention and they will be losing context. And the same happens on the hardware level because only one CPU can work with a single memory location or even cache line at the same time. And to pass this cache line between cores, it takes time. Uh, so on the physical level, uh, we still have the same locking. It's just one level lower and it's finer grained. Uh, but since it's finer grained, uh, we do lock and lock more frequently and it can actually uh, make performance even worse in some cases. And with this analogy, the right solution becomes obvious, right? We just need, each, uh, need to give each developer own desk so that they can work completely independently. So let's try to apply this to our scheduler. Uh, we introduce per thread state and we move our run queue to this per thread state. So now each thread can, when it creates a goroutine, it puts it on the own run queue, and when it needs to pick the next goroutine to run, it takes it from the own run queue. Uh, and all threads can do this completely independently. So this makes uh, the scheme scalable. We still have the global run queue and the mutex, but uh, those are used only in some special cases and don't affect scalability in general. And um, there are other things that suffer from the same contention problem. Uh, for example, goroutines usually allocate memory more frequently than they create other goroutines. So now we can uh, move the, our memory allocator cache also to the per thread state um, so that they can all allocate memory uh, independently from each other. And also maybe some other caches. Okay, but now we have the next problem. Uh, main question that the scheduler needs to answer is what is the next goroutine to run? And it was simple to answer with the single run queue because we just take the goroutine from that run queue. But now when we have more complex architecture, it becomes not so obvious. So what we do is we first the thread checks the local run queue. And if there is a goroutine to run, it will run that goroutine. Uh, 
Uh, if it's empty, it will check the global run queue next, and then it will invoke the network puller. And the last thing it will do what's commonly called work stealing. So work stealing is simply checking the local queues of other threads to see if they have any work. And this uh, gives us load balancing capability and helps to avoid the situation when one thread has lots of work and other threads are idle. So at this point, we also get a scalable scheduler thanks to this state dis distribution. So are we good now? No, uh, the next problem is with threads and system calls. So we, we've seen that we can have more threads and cores. For example, we may have four cores and a hundred of, hundred of threads. And si since each thread has their own run queue, now during work stealing, uh, thread will need to check hundred hundred of other run queues to see if they have any work. And most of them will be empty, so this will add constant overhead. And the same applies to the memory allocator cache, uh, because we will waste lots of memory in caches of all of those idle threads. So how can we resolve this? We added, we split our entity onto two levels, and that helped us to resolve some of the problems. So what if we introduce three levels now? So we still have our go routines and we have threads, and now we add the third entity, which is called processor. Uh, processor is a resource required to run Go code. So we, we, now we have, say, four threads. They uh, own four of those CPUs and run four go routines. And number of the processor objects is exactly equal to the number of cores. So we uh, create four of them, and we never create more dynamically. Uh, we, we may have other threads, which are, say, idle or in system calls, but since they don't actively run Go code, uh, they don't need a processor. So how do we apply this to our scheduler? We introduce a new object, which is called processor, and we move the run queue and the malloc cache and other caches to this object. Uh, so now we have fixed number of those processors and fixed number of threads that use those processors to run Go routines and some other threads in system calls or idle. Now, during work stealing, each thread needs to check only a fixed number of other run queues to, to, to find other, uh, work. Uh, so we resolved our kind of efficiency problem with polling. Oh, sorry. And the same applies to the malloc cache. Now we have specifically a right number of the memory allocator caches, no more and no less than we need. So if we have four cores, we'll have exactly four memory allocator caches. Uh, how do we handle system calls now? So let's say we have a thread which uses a processor to run a goroutine, and it enters into system call. The last thing it does, it wakes another thread, and then it uh, hands off the processor object to that other thread. So now the, the second thread will take the goroutine from the run queue and use the processor object to run it. So this allows us to increase number of threads without increasing number of run queues and malloc caches. And it turned out to be very handy and useful abstraction. Uh, it's similar to the per CPU data structures, but without the corresponding limitations and complexity. And with this, we also get an efficient scheduler. And this, this last scheme is roughly how the scheduler is implemented in, in the Go runtime right now. Um, so at this point, we consider the scheduler problem solved. Um, there's always an infinite number how we can improve things here and there, but at least there are no major problems now. And with this, we move to the next part, which is related to fairness. So what is fairness? Fairness is a property of the scheduler and that simply says that if a goroutine is runnable, we will run it eventually. Uh, the only situation that is not okay is if we have a goroutine which is ready to run, but we fail to run it for a prolonged period of time. Uh, that would be called starvation. Uh, a goroutine is starved of CPU resources. And why we want fairness and why, why it's important thing? Uh, the, the simplest implication is if we don't have fairness, we can have bad tail latencies, 
just because we have a request, but we fail to service it for a long time because we always choose to, to do something else. And we can also get even live logs and other pathological behaviors. So let's see how we can get a live log. Uh, consider we have a weather forecast server. Um, what it does, it computes some first approximation of the forecast, and then it can compute a more precise uh, forecast, and then it can make it more precise, and so on. So you can do infinite number of kind of computation to make it better and better. And then at some point, we send it a request and ask to send us the, the current forecast. What you'd expect to happen is that it will send the current forecast uh, in response, right? But what it does instead, it says, nope, you know, I have that other work to do, so I will instead compute the, the, the more precise forecast. And then after that, it again says, okay, no, I will decide to do that work. Uh, so we'll never actually reply to the response because we already have an infinite amount of work to do. And this kind of makes this server not particularly useful, right? Uh, and if you wonder uh, if this can happen in practice, this very real scenario. Uh, so fairness is like oxygen. And wh what I mean by that is that uh, nobody wants oxygen while you have it. And if you don't have it, it's suddenly the most important thing to have because everything is so bad. And also, nobody wants to pay for oxygen. We just assume that it's out there for free. And the same applies to fairness. It's, it's kind of not the most visible property, but it's important, and nobody wants to pay for fairness. So let's see what, uh, what, what this means in practice. The simplest example of a fair scheduler would be using a single five for run queue. Uh, if a goroutine is, is in this run queue, then right, we, it, it can't escape that we run it. Eventually, we'll get to that goroutine and, and run it. And the simplest example of a non-fair scheduler would be using a live for run queue, last in, first out. Um, we can have a, two goroutines that constantly respawn each other and occupy the head of this stack, and then we never get to the bottom of the stack. So the goroutines at the bottom will starve, and we never run them. And this brings us to the inherent fairness performance trade-off. Right? We try to use the single run queue, and we've seen that it's not scalable, and we don't want to get back to the single queue. And also, FIFO is the worst thing for locality, because we always run the oldest thing. Uh, uh, and it's LIFO that is good for locality, because we always run the newest thing. <clears throat> so what we would like to have, we would like to have some minimal amount of fairness that uh, just allows us to resolve those pathological scenarios. Uh, but at a very minimal cost, because nobody wants to pay for fairness. So how can we achieve this? Uh, the story starts uh, at the level of a single goroutine. Consider that we have a goroutine that is in some kind of infinite loop, and it just never stops. And then we have another goroutine, and that one will be starved, because we always run the first one. So to resolve this, we use preemption. Preemption is asynchronously asking a goroutine to stop. So goroutine can block on a channel, and then it will itself say, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, don't run me anymore, run something else. Uh, but during preemption, some, somebody else asks his goroutine to stop and let somebody else run. So the Go uses time slice of about approximately 10 milliseconds, and after that time slice, it preempts a goroutine if it still runs. And this 10 milliseconds is uh, somewhat soft limit, Again, because of the performance, uh, because ensuring more strict guarantees would probably have a performance hit. And the preempted goroutines go to the tail of the global uh, run queue, which is FIFO. So this means roughly you run after everybody else. Okay, the next level is related to local queue. So the local queue is FIFO, which is was chosen specifically because of the fairness, but it's not the whole truth. The whole truth is that there's also one element life a buffer in front of this FIFA queue. Let's first see why we added this uh, one element life a buffer. Uh, we wanted to support the following scenario. Let's say we have a goroutine and it uh, creates or unblocks the second goroutine. 
And very soon after that, it itself blocks, uh, probably waiting for the second guillotine. So in this scenario, we want to uh, do a kind of a direct switch and immediately start running the second guillotine because this gives us the best locality. And this is a very common pattern in practice and supporting this is important for performance. Uh, so to achieve this, we need two things. One, we need to ensure that the second guillotine will be the, our next guillotine to run, and that's what the LIFO slot gives us. And the second thing, we want to ensure that another thread will not steal our second guillotine in that short period of time when we unblock the second guillotine, but the first guillotine hasn't blocked yet. Right? So there is that brief window of time when uh, the second guillotine is still in the, in the runnable state. And we also use the LIFO slot for this. Uh, we restrict other threads from stealing from the LIFO slot of other threads. Um, restrict stealing from that slot for at least three microseconds. So the first thread has three microseconds to block and start running the second routine. So uh, this complex of measures allows us to support this direct switch pattern in majority of cases which is important for performance. But the problem is that even one element, life a buffer, is enough to get starvation. Uh, again, consider we have two goroutines that constantly respawn each other and occupy this one element slot, and then the rest of the goroutines in the queue are starved. And to resolve this, we use time slice inheritance. So I've said that uh, goroutine has a time slice of 10 milliseconds after which it will be preempted. And when we take the next goroutine to run from this LIFO slot, it inherits the same time slice. So if we continue taking from that slot, uh, after 10 milliseconds, we still will preempt whatever is running at that point and, and run something else. So this will resolve the starvation. The next level is related to the global run queue. Let's say we have, again, goroutines that respawn each other and they occupy the local run queue. So we never pull the global run queue. So in the scheduler, we have approximately the following code. Uh, we first check the local run queue. If it has a goroutine, we run that goroutine. Otherwise, we check the global run queue. And to resolve this type of starvation, we added the following code. So we added the scheduler tick variable, which is incremented every time we pick the next goroutine to run. And if the scheduler tick becomes multiple of 61, then we actually uh, check the global run queue before the local run queue. So this allows us to eventually take that potentially starv starving goroutine from the global queue and run it. Now you may wonder, whether, what is 61? Why? It's not even 42. Uh, so uh, on, on one hand, it was somewhat r random choice, but on another, there, there were reasons to choose this number. So one, uh, we wanted something that is not too small because otherwise we pull the global run queue too frequently and we get back to our contention problem. And, uh, then we wanted something that is not too large because otherwise we don't resolve the starvation. And we also wanted it to be prime. So you might expect to use something like 64, which is a power of two, so we could check is multiple of faster but you, by using a bit mask. Uh, but we decided to use a prime, and the reason for this is interesting. Uh, it's related to choosing size of a hash map. So consider we have a hash map with a size 64. And we happen to have bad hash values, which are multiple of eight, because, say, they're, they're, uh, they are pointers. What we'll get is that every eight slot will be, bucket will be overloaded and the rest will be empty, which is a disaster for hash map. Uh, and if we use size of 61, that it would ensure that the values hashes are distributed much more uh, evenly in the hash map. Uh, the root cause is that the size of the hash map 64 uh, causes interference with the application pattern. And uh, use of 61 allows to remove this interference. So with 61, it's still possible, but it just becomes uh, much less likely because the hashes would need to be very weird to, to cause interference. And that's exactly the, the reason why we choose 61 in the scheduler. So we wanted to avoid any possible interference of this number with any application patterns. 
because as a result, we would then potentially prefer running some goroutines more than running some other goroutines, and that's by definition unfair. So that's how the number 61 appeared in the runtime. Uh, the last level is related to the network polar. So let's say we have our weather forecast server and it has infinite amount of work already, so we never pull the network. We could use the previous solution and check the network polar from time to time, uh, but the problem is that checking network polar involves uh, doing actual system call, for example, epoll wait. Uh, we are checking the global run queue is just checking a variable in memory. So we didn't want that overhead on the scheduler fast pass. So instead, we added a background thread that will pull the network uh, occasionally if it wasn't pulled by uh, main worker threads. So to summarize, on the Goroutine level, we use preemption. Um, then uh, for local queue, we use time slice inheritance. Uh, then we check the global queue every once in a while, and we have a background thread pull network. And this hierarchy of measures gives us that minimal amount of fairness that's enough to avoid uh, any pathological behaviors, and none of those measures have any significant cost. And with this, we move to the next part, which is related to stacks. So first of all, I need to give a brief recap of what are stacks and how tra traditional stacks work. Um, each function in vacations need uh, an area of memory which is called function frame, and this is where the function will store local variables, return address, and uh, pointer to the previous frame for unwinding purposes, maybe something else. And the stack is exactly the area of memory where we store those function frames. So for a C program, we will have initially the main uh, frame of the main function on the stack. Uh, and the funny thing is that stacks grow down for obscure historical reasons. And now if a main calls function foo, then we'll allocate the frame for the function foo next to main. And then if foo calls bar, we'll get a bar frame next. And uh, then when bar returns, uh, we will remove that, deallocate that frame. Uh, so it's actually, the stack is actually a stack in the sense that it's LIFO. And we call thing called stack pointer, uh, which points to the current top of the stack so that we know where to allocate the next uh, frame. It's usually stored in the RSP register of the x86 processor. And as I said, each uh, frame contains the local temp variables, return address, previous function pointer. Okay, now on a physical level, stack is implemented as a large uh, range of a virtual address space. Uh, it's usually somewhere around from one to eight megabytes by default. Usually you can uh, request other size. And it can consist of a set of a physical pages. Uh, and the thing is that those pages are allocated lazily. So as we first touch a page, the operating system will actually allocate a physical page and map it to that, to that page of virtual address space. So usually we have some pages in the beginning of the stack that are actually allocated and we pay the memory cost for them. And then we can have the large part of the stack not allocated, so we don't pay the memory cost for that. And at the end, there is usually a protected guard page. And I will show later why we need it. So uh, compiler adds some code to the function to manipulate uh, those stack frames. Here you can see uh, sell the code for this. So let's see what it does. Uh, consider we, we want to allocate a stack frame of size 64. First we uh, subtract 64 from the RSP register and we subtract because stacks grow down. And this gives us a pointer to the current stack frame. And then we can use this, this range as a storage for our local variables to get a store and load to the fields of that object. And at the end of the function, we add 64 back to RSP to deallocate the frame. And the reason why this organization is used and why it's done exactly in this way is performance. So stacks are cheap. If you look at the corresponding assembly code, 
then we will see that each of those separations is just one machine instruction. Uh, and uh, say the allocation and deallocation are also very cheap instructions because they don't even touch any memory. They just operate on the CPU register. And you may ask now, so we allocate a stack frame, but we, didn't, we don't check for overflow. So what do we actually run of the stack space? Uh, there's no check here. Uh, and that's why we need the protected guard page. It's protected, so any access to that page will cause a trap and the operating system will terminate the process. So if we allocate a frame and step onto that guard page, we'll get a trap, terminate it, um, and as a result, we don't need an explicit check in the code. And the reason for this is, again, performance, because um, each instruction in this sequence penalizes effectively just every function out there in the world. So it's like super expensive. Okay, so this is how traditional stacks work. Uh, can we use this paging-based traditional stack to implement our infinite goroutine stacks? Right, we have lazy paging, lazy allocation of the pages, and we have 64-bit virtual address space, which is tons of memory. So could we just allocate a huge chunk of memory as a stack for a goroutine and then lazily page, uh, page in pages so that, that we pay only for the small part that the goroutine actually uses? Uh, that's a reasonable question. So first of all, we need to define what, what infinite means because right, there is nothing infinite in our computers. When I asked several people what would you consider an infinite stack, uh, they, they said that, well, one gigabyte will probably be an infinite enough. And one gigabyte is also what Go uses as an implementation limit on the stack size. And it's also just a nice round number. So let's say one gigabyte is infinite enough. And it turns out that paging would not work because we actually don't have enough address space. Uh, while our pointers are 64 bits, uh, the actual address space is supported by CPUs uh, today is only 48 bits. And one bit is usually taken by the kernel, so we have only 47 bits, which is 128 terabytes of memory, which is still sounds like a lot of memory. But if we divide this by one gigabyte, we get only 128,000 stacks, which is less than our target goal of one million. Right, and it's even today. Tomorrow people will want tens of millions of goroutines. And the 32-bit systems are still around. If you live in a server world, you may have forgot about them, but for example, for ARM system, it's still pretty common. And there is no way we can get one gigabyte stacks on the 32-bit system. <clears throat> and the page gr granularity is also a bit suboptimal because we, we need to spend at least a page. So if we have a million of goroutines, we will spend four gigabytes on that. And we may also have some problems with performance because sooner or later we will need to release and use pages back to the system. For example, if a Gertin used lots of memory and then it either not uses that for a long time or we re reuse the stack for another Gertin which doesn't need that much stack, we'll need to return that. And for that we'll need to do system calls and we'll also need to keep track of what was paged in. And this also will conflict with huge pages. I will not go into details, ask me later if you're interested. So what can we do? Let's look again at this code for the normal stack. So this is the code that you already seen, nothing new here. So uh, what we do is we add an explicit overflow check in the beginning. So we compare the value of the RSP with the stack limit stored in the thread local storage. And if we see that we're going to overflow the stack, we call into runtime. And if we look at the assembly, uh, this adds just three more instructions in the beginning of the function. Uh, first instruction loads the pointer to the goroutine descriptor from the thread local storage into RCX register. Uh, then the second one loads the stack limit from the goroutine descriptor and compares it with the RSP register. And if we see that we don't have enough stack, we jump to the slow pass and call into runtime to do something. So let's see what we can do. 
Uh, what we can do is we can implement so-called split stacks. Uh, let's see how they work. Uh, so we have, a instead of a large stack, we now have a stack segment, which is, say, one kilobyte. We again have the man, main function frame on the stack. We have our RSP register. And now we also have the limit of the stack. So let's say we call a function four, and we actually have space for that. So we just allocate the frame, move the RSP register. Everything is fine. And now we try to call a function bar, and we see that the RSP would overflow the stack. So what we do at this point, we call into runtime. And what the runtime does is it allocates another stack segment and links it to the previous one and resets the RSP and the limit to the new segment. So now we again have enough stack space and we can call the bar function here. Uh, and this can repeat. We, we can allocate three, four, five segments as necessary. And when the bar function returns, we deallocate the, the second segment, return it to runtime, and continue running on the first segment. So with this scheme, we can actually get a million of goroutines, million of stacks, because we don't consume lots of memory per one goroutine. And this will work nicely on the 32-bit systems because we don't reserve huge amounts of virtual address space. And we also have better granularity, and more importantly, we have control over the granularity. So if necessary, we can use smaller segments or larger segments or mixed size segments, whatever we want. And we can also easily release uh, unused memory, and this doesn't conflict with the huge pages. But there's some cost. So normal function call with the check costs about two nanoseconds when we don't go into the slow path. And now if we hit this stack split and need to call into runtime, allocate the new segment, reset the registers, return, then undo all of this, this now takes about 60 nanoseconds per call. So it's not too much in absolute numbers because it's still nanoseconds. But there is a problem. Consider we have parse request function, uh, which has a loop which iterates over the request data and parses an integer from it in the loop. So let's say our request contains lots of integers. And this function is hot, and this loop is hot, and this parse integer function is cheap. Now, if it happens that this parse integer function call causes a stack split and the cost of the loop was also around tens of nanoseconds, then we can easily make the whole applications two times slower because we're hitting this, this overhead on each iteration. And there's even worse a problem. So let's say we are writing this code or reading this code. And we know that it's going to be important for performance. And now we try to answer the question, will this call cause a stack split? And there's no way we can practically answer this question. And even if it's a library code, uh, it may be called from different places. So we, it's not even theoretically possible to answer this question. So this gives us a primitive with a non-transparent performance which is a very bad thing for, for, for any language primitive because I, as a developer, when I write code, I want to have some model, some cost model. Right? I want to understand if this is cheaper than that, can I use this in this context, and so on. And there's another problem. Let's say we have some performance expert who tuned the performance and we actually call this function only from one place and we, we ensure that we it all fits in one stack, se stack segment. We don't split stack. Everything is great. Uh, we deploy this code to production. Then we get a critical bug report about some issue in the OS request function, which is completely not critical for performance. And a developer goes and, oh, sorry, goes and fixes it and adds a test. Everything is good. Deploy the code to production. Now, it happened that this fix slightly increased the size of the frame for the OS request function. Now all other frames have shifted, and now we get the, actually the split stack in our hot loop, and we suddenly get a slowdown of 2x for, for the whole application. So it's not the thing that you want right, for your programming language when you did a small change in a completely unrelated part of the program, which is not important for performance, and suddenly your performance drops two times. So this combination of a non-transparent performance is, and 
non-stable performance is very bad for any language primitive. <clears throat> so because of that, go switch to different scheme, which is called growable stacks. Let's see how they work. So we again have a small stack, say one kilobyte. We have the my main function frame. We have the RSP and limit. Everything is the same. We call function foo. We call function bar. See the overflow call and the runtime. But now runtime does a different thing. It allocates a new larger stack. Uh, and it copies the data from the old stack to the new one and sets the RSP and limit to the new stack. And then deallocates the old one. So now this is our new stack. And now we can call the bar function here. And when we return, we do nothing. So at least not right now. <clears throat> so we still keep, keep using the larger stack. So now if, sorry, now if this was our hot split problem, we just solved it because we can call uh, bar function repeatedly without paying any additional cost. So let's look at the performance for those two implementations. For the split stack, we had had one of one cost per function call, but this cost can be repeated multiple times. So the worst case would be a stack split in a hot loop. And for the global stack, we have O of N cost per function call because we need to copy the whole stack to the new one. But this cost can be amortized. So the worst case for this would be if we have a short go routine and we grow the stack multi maybe multiple times and then uh, right after that, the guarantee finishes. So we, we was not able to amortize the cost. So it's not that the, this new scheme is better than the old one. It has a different performance cost. Uh, but it turned out that this new scheme is better from a practical point of view. Because one, uh, the, this worst case, the new worst case seem to, seem to happen less frequently in practice. And performance is also more transparent and stable because it's usually you don't get lots of you know very large number of very short go routines just by some accident after some small change somewhere and the user can fix it if necessary right if you have lots of short go routines we can use batching and make a go routine do more work uh, and then we will amortize the cost of the stack growth and also cost of the go routine creation so it's just better on all fronts and for the uh, function call, uh, if we penalize a function call or some primitive operation like integer addition, uh, it's very unexpected and it's, there's not much user can do about this, right? If you need to add two integers, right, there's no workaround to not use the integer addition or a function call. So for now, go for several years, go on the growable continuous stacks and they seem to work very well in practice. Okay, another uh, thing related performance brings us back to the scheduler design. So I said that uh, we have this processor object and we have the memory allocator cache and some other caches. So the stack segment cache is one of those other caches uh, because all threads also need to grow and shrink stacks independently of each other. But there are still other caches for other language features. And an interesting fact is that stack, uh, split stacks are available in GCC for native code. Uh, it was added as part of supporting the Go language, but it was also enabled and implemented for the, for the C code. So you can use GCC with the F split stack flag and compile a C code, and then you will see the function prolog as I showed you, and the thread will actually use those small segments. Uh, but that's only for split stacks. Growable stacks are not available because Global stacks require copying objects, and that's not something you can do for, for native code. Okay, and with this, we move to the last part, which is related to preemption. So preemption is asynchronously asking a goroutine to yield. Uh, why we want preemption? First of all, we have more goroutines than threads. So we need the preemption to, for fairness and to multiplex uh, that large number of goroutines on, on the smaller number of threads, uh, which gives much more intuitive programming model for user. And also we use it for several auxiliary functions. Uh, for example, garbage collector needs to stop the world sometimes. So it needs to stop everything that's running and do some global action. 
And that's where preemption is very useful because we can preempt everybody and say and ask them to stop. And it's, it's also used uh, when we want to print a crash dump because when one goroutine prints, uh, Go prints the stacks of all goroutines. So then the first thing that we need to do, we need to stop everybody else to do a reliable unwind of those stacks. And preemption is also like oxygen because it's not the most visible property. Like nobody particularly asks for it, but if it's missing, then things go wrong and nobody wants to pay for it. So there are, there are two main implementation strategies for preemption. One is based on the signals. Uh, so when we want to preempt the goroutine, we send a signal to the, that thread that runs that goroutine, and then the signal handl handler will arrange to, to yield. Okay, and the advantage is that it's fast in the sense that it doesn't slow down the normal execution. And that's a strategy used by the operating system to preempt threads. It just uses uh, timer interrupts. But there is a number of problems. So first of all, it highly, becomes highly operating system dependent and maybe even architecture dependent. And managed runtimes usually have some kind of regions that are very unfortunate for preemption. Um, and since we can't choose the exact instruction where the signal will be delivered, it may be delivered inside of those unfortunate regions and then it becomes quite hard to deal with that. And we may also need more uh, meta information for GC so that it can understand where the pointers are at each potential preemption point. So because of that, we decided to not use this. And the second implementation scheme uh, based on the cooperative checks. In this scheme, the compiler inserts the uh, checks uh, into the beginning of each function and into every loop. And this additional code just uh, explicitly checks if some variable was I preempted, and if yes, it, uh, it calls into runtime. And this, this approach is great. It solves all of the problem of the previous approach, except that it's now slow because we have this additional code and it penalizes normal execution. And the slowdown can be anywhere from one to 10% depending on the program, which is not acceptable. So it turned out that there is a, there is a clever trick we can, we can do to kind of combine advantages of both approaches. So let's look at our function prolog. Uh, what we do here, we compare the stack limits stored in the goroutine descriptor with the RSP, and if we don't have enough stack space, we call into runtime. So what we can do is we can asynchronously spoof the stack limit. We just stamp uh, some very large value without any synchronization into the goroutine descriptor. And this means that at next function call, uh, this overflow check is guaranteed to fail and we'll, that goroutine will call into runtime. And then when we are in the runtime already on the slow path, we will figure out that we, we, we have the stack space but we were asked to uh, yield, so we will restore the original stack limit and call into scheduler. And this approach gives us the no, absolutely no penalty for, for no normal code execution on top of what we already had. And it's also portable, simple, and GC friendly. The only problem is with loops because we don't do anything with loops. But it turned out that it's usually not a problem in practice uh, because to become a problem, a loop needs to do no function calls at all. So no synchronization, no memory allocation, no channels, no hash maps, no input, output, nothing. Just maybe process some array of data. And it also needs to process a large amount of data, maybe tens or hundreds of megabytes, because if it's small loop, then we'll just wait when it finishes and then preempt. Okay, and now let's briefly look into potential future improvements. So one, we are still looking now at the potential non-cooperative preemption which uses signals because of the loops problem. So we probably will trade some of the implementation complexity for to remove some more rough edges from the programming model. <clears throat> Then uh, this function prolog, I said that it's each, each instruction penalizes every function call out there and we added three more instructions, which is not good. So what we can do is we may try to cache the stack limit 
right in the thread local storage, and this would eliminate one instruction and one memory load. Or we may even try to uh, take one register from the generated code and cache the stack limit right in the register. Then we would need to compare just two registers, which would be cheaper. And there, there is even more interesting potential schemes. For example, if we, if we have 4K stack, which is at least 1K aligned, uh, then if RSP moves within this 1K region, then we know for sure that we, uh, that we don't have a stack overflow. Uh, we can get a stack overflow only if we cross the boundary of the one kilobyte. Uh, so this would require some more math, but it doesn't require touching any memory, and it doesn't require um, taking any registers from the generated code. So we can just look at the value of the RSP and figure out if we potentially may have a stack overflow. Then for scheduler, I said that this processor thing is very nice, uh, but we didn't yet move all of the stuff to the processor. In particular, timers are sharded, but they're global. So there's just fixed number of timer partitions, and the network polar is just global, so it's a single EPOL descriptor. So what we'd like to do is to move them actually to the processor, uh, but it's not completely trivial to do because uh, for the timer, the main thing is the uh, when the next timer will fire, when is the closest time the timer will fire. So if anybody sleeps, it knows when to wake to run the next timer. And this is a global property, so we can't, if Fred wants to sleep just on one timer partition, like it still needs to somehow infer that global value. And uh, there's also a problem if we have really lots of cores. Because this processor thing is nice, it allows us to get reasonably efficient, scalable, but the current scheme is completely flat. Uh, so if we have hundreds of cores, we get lots of overhead for work stealing still, and we don't have any notion of locality beyond the single, single core. So I think what we would need in, in future, we need to make the scheduler more aware of the system system structure so that it knows that there are, say, two Newman nodes, uh, they, those have some cores, those have hyperthreads, so that we can do more local uh, work stealing, and we can also maybe allocate some local memory. But that's also not trivial to do, and this is not done yet. Okay. So we, to recap, we implemented lightweight goroutines by splitting them into two entities. We can handle input, output, and system calls efficiently. We get a parallel scheduler, we get a scalable scheduler, thanks to state distribution. Uh, we get the efficient uh, scheduler thanks to the third processor entity. And we ensure, ensure that our scheduler is fair, and we implemented infinite stacks using our growable continuous stacks idea, and we implemented almost preemptible execution at a very low cost, and we looked at future a bit. And that's it, thank you. Now I'm ready to take questions. And we have two minutes, but- Yes, we I, have two minutes more, so. I will be available in the discussion room later. Uh, Hi, I wanted to ask a question about growable stacks. So you said that the split stack stuff, uh, split stack uh, idea, uh, it covers the case when you need to shrink the stack, but how do you shrink the growable stack? Okay, the question about shrinking growable stacks. So we still can shrink in them, we just don't do it right when we return from the function. Uh, we shrink them currently during GC cycles. So during GC, we scan all the stacks and we also check their sizes. Uh, and we can see if it's too large and kind of the use space is too small, then we can say maybe incrementally start shrinking it. So it's part of GC cycle right yes. now? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I have a question about global stack two. Uh, uh, is uh, there a problem uh, for memory fragmentation if uh, it's 
uh, various size of stacks of many versions mm -hmm. uh, and uh, is it uh, reduce uh, usable memory for stacks mm -hmm. the, the question is about potential fragmentation for the stack segments so I haven't seen any issues filed by users so as far as I remember we use so-called body allocator so let's say we allocate a 16 kilobyte chunk with if necessary, you split it into two eight kilobyte chunks and that into two four kilobyte chunks and so on. And if two adjacent chunks become empty, they can be reused as a larger, uh, as a twice as large chunk. So this somewhat nicely avoids parts of the fragmentation. Uh, it's probably possible to build some worst cases against this, but we haven't seen them in, in practice. <laughs> 